I've not been able to shut my eyes all night. So great was my desire to know how Kalameko and the others were getting on. While waiting, I've been killing time in various ways. I said matins, read a life of one of the Holy Fathers, went into church and relit a lamp that had gone out, changed the veil on a Madonna that works miracles. How many times have I told those friars to keep her clean? And then they are surprised that people aren't devout anymore. I can remember the time when there were 500 ex-votos. Today, there aren't 20. It's our own fault. We haven't known how to keep up her reputation. Every evening after Compline, we used to have a procession in there. We used to sing louds there every Saturday. We were always making vows. So there were always fresh ex-votos on the altar. We used to comfort our confessors and get them to make offerings to her. Now none of this is done, and they're surprised that the life's gone out of it all. Oh, the dim-wittedness of my brothers in Christ. But I hear a, a rumpus in Masonitia's house. By my fair faith, there they are. They're shoving their prisoner out of the house. I'm just in time. They're certainly, they, they certainly took ages getting him out. It's daybreak already. I'll stay and listen without letting them see me. You take this side, and I'll take the other. Cyril, you take him by his cloak from behind. Don't hurt me. Don't worry, just get moving. Don't let's go any further. You're right. Let's let him go. Let's give him a couple of turns so that he won't know which house he came out of. Round with him, Cyril. Here we go. One more. There you are. My loot. Be off, you scoundrel, and if I ever hear you breathe a word about this, I'll slit your windpipe for you. He's gone. Now let's go and get these disguises off, and we must all be seen out of doors bright and early so that it shan't appear that we've been all we've been up all night. Correct? You and Ciro go find Master Kalameko and tell him all went well. But what can we tell him? We don't know a thing, as you know. When, when we got into the house, we went straight down to the cellar and started drinking. You and your mother-in-law were there, were still at grips with him when we left you. We didn't see you again till just now, when you brought us to pull him out. That's true. Oh, I've got some fine things to tell you. My wife was in bed in the dark. Sustrata was waiting for me by the fire. I got up there with the said young fellow, and to leave nothing to chance, I took him into a small room off the big room, where the lamp cast a very faint light. We, he, he could be, he could hardly see my face. Wisely done. I made him undress. When he boggled, I turned on him and showed him my teeth like a dog. He couldn't get out of his clothes fast enough. Finally, he was naked. He'd got quite an ugly mug. His nose was tremendous. His mouth was sort of, sort of twisted. But you never saw such fine skin. White, soft, smooth as for the rest. Don't ask. No good talking of that sort of stuff. You had to see it. You're not making fun of me? Well, since I had my hands in the dough, so to speak, I decided to go through with it and find out if the fellow was hale and hearty. For if he had the pox, where would I be then, huh? Oh, you're right. As soon as I saw he was healthy, I dragged him to the bedroom, put him into bed, and before I left, stuck in both hands to feel how things were going. I'm not a man to make a firefly for a lantern. How prudently you've managed this affair. Having made this checkup, I left the room, bolted the door, and went to join my mother-in-law by the fire, where we spent the whole night talking. What about? About how foolish Lucrezia had been, and how about and about how much better it would have been if she'd given in without silly shallying. Then we talked about the baby. I felt as if I held him in my arms already. Dear little chap. Then I heard it striking seven, and fearing that day might be breaking any minute. Back I went into the bedroom. Now, what would you say if I told you that I just couldn't 
wake the scoundrel up. I can well believe it. He'd enjoy the, his anointing. Finally, I got him up, called you, and we whisked him out of the house. Things have gone well. Now, what will you say if I tell you I'm sorry? About what? About that young man to have to die so soon that this night should cost him so dear. That's his problem. Don't you have your own worries? You're right. But it will seem a thousand years before I meet Master Calameco and share my joys with him. He'll be out and about within the hour, but it's broad daylight now. We'll go and get these things off. What will you do? I'll go home, too, and put on my best clothes. I'll have them get my wife up and wash. Then I'll see that, that she goes to church to receive a blessing on this night's work. I'd, I'd like you and Calameco to be there, and we should talk to the friar and th thank and reward him for his good offices. An excellent notion. Let's do that. I heard what they were saying and liked it. What a stupid fellow this Messer Nietzsche is. It was the conclusion that they came to that pleased me most. And since they'll be coming to see me, I won't stay here. I'll wait for them in church where my merchandise will have a greater value. But who's coming out of that house? It looks like Ligurio, and the man with him must be Calameco. I don't want them to find me here for the reason I just gave. After all, if they don't come and see me, there's always time for me to go and see them. <sighs> As I've already told you, my dear Ligurio, I didn't begin to be happy till past three o'clock this morning, because though I had a lot of pleasure, I hadn't really enjoyed it. But then I revealed to her who I was, and made her appreciate the love I bore her, and went on to tell her how we easily, because of her husband's simple-mindedness, we should be able to live together in happiness without the slightest scandal. I finished by promising her that whenever it pleased God to translate her husband, I should take her as my wife. She thought this over, and having, among other things, tasted the difference between my performance and Nietzsche's, between, that is, the kisses of a young lover and those of an old husband, she said to me after leaving several sighs, Since your guile, my husband's folly, the simple-mindedness of my mother, and the wickedness of my father confessor, have led me to do what I should never have done on my, of my own free will. I must judge it to be heaven that willed it so, and I cannot find it in myself to refuse what heaven wishes me to accept. In consequence, I take you for my lord, my master, and my guide. You are my father, my defender, my love and sovereign good, and what my husband wanted, and one night I want him to have forever. So make friends with him and go to church this morning, and then come and have dinner with us. You shall come and go as you please, and we shall be able to meet at any time without arousing the least suspicion. When I heard these words, I was ravished by their sweetness. I, I couldn't tell her more than a fraction of what I wished to say in the reply. I'm the happiest and most contented man that ever walked this earth, and if neither death nor time take my happiness from me, the saints themselves shall be called, shall call me blessed. I am delighted to hear all of your good fortune. Everything's worked out just as I said it would. But where do we go from here? We walk in the direction of the church because I promised her I'd be there. She'll be coming with her mother and Messer Nietzsche. I can hear their door opening. Yes, it's the ladies and the learned doctors bringing up the rear. Let's go into the church and wait for them there. Lucrezia, it is my belief that we should do things in a God-fearing manner, not foolishly. Why, what is there to do now? There, the answer she gives me, she's getting quite cocky. You mustn't be so surprised. She's a little bit changed. What are you getting at? I meant that it would be best for me to go on ahead and have a word with Friar Timoteo. I want to tell him to meet us at the church door so he can confer the blessing on you. Why, this morning it's as if you'd been re reborn. Then why don't you get moving? You look saucy this morning. Last night you seemed half dead. I have you to thank, haven't I? Go and find Friar Timoteo, but there's no need. He's just coming out of church. So he is. Calameco and Ligurio told me that Messer Nietzsche and the ladies are on the way to church, so I've come out. Bona dies, Father. Welcome, and heaven's blessing upon you, Madonna. May God give you a fine baby boy. May God so will it. You may rely on that. He will, so will it. 
Is it Liguria and Master Kamameko that I see there in church? Yes, Matsera. Invite them over. Come, sirs. God save you. Master Kalameko, give me wife here your hand. Willingly. Lucrezia, when we have left after support our old age, we shall owe it to this man. I hold him dear. May, be, may he be a good friend of the family. Heaven bless you. I should be like him in Ligurio to come and dine with us this morning. By all means. And I should like to give them the key to the downstairs room off the loja so that they can come and go when they like. If they have no women at home, they must like live like beasts. I accept, and I'll use whatever the occasion arises. Am I to have the money for the almsing, almsgiving? You are, dom Domine. I shall be sending you some today. Does no one remember poor old Sura? He only has to ask. I'm at his service. Lucrezia, how much shall I give the friar for his blessing? Give him ten groats. God almighty, he nearly chokes. Madonna Sestrada, you seem to have taken on a new lease of life. Who wouldn't be happy today? Let us enter the church and say the customary prayers. After the service, go dine at your leisure. As for you spectators, don't wait for us to come out again. The service is long, and I shall stay in church, and we'll go off home through the side door. Farewell. <laughs>